Why do so many cars now come with a turbocharger? Have you noticed that engine sizes are getting smaller and more of them are coming with turbochargers? Well, you can understand manufacturers doing this. It means they can make smaller, lighter engines. They're using less material to produce the engine and they're also able to meet emissions regulations. So they're effectively making a small engine that puts out as much power as a much larger naturally aspirated engine. So it's more efficient. And because the engine is smaller and lighter, the car is carrying less weight. There's another eco fuel saving advantage there. But are turbochargers a good thing? Let's just try and understand the turbocharger and how it actually works and benefits the car and the driver. Please let me know in the comments if you're a big fan of turbos or you absolutely hate them. I find that people fall into two categories. Here in the UK, we might say it's one of those Marmite things. People either love them or hate them. There's no halfway ground. So let me know how you stand on the debate as to turbochargers and whether they're the best thing since sliced bread or not. The turbocharger, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but think of it as having two propellers. One propeller on one end is driven by the exhaust gases, and that spins a propeller on the intake side that pulls more air into the engine. So it effectively compresses that air. So why is that a good thing? Why do car manufacturers like turbochargers so much? Well, we need to touch on volumetric efficiency. That's the amount of volume that an engine can utilize in terms of air, mixing it with fuel and producing power. In a naturally aspirated engine, you're depending very much on the atmospheric air pressure going into the engine. So as, as the piston goes down, it creates a vacuum. It sucks in air, but there is a limit to how much air it can suck in. And that's partly down to the capacity of the cylinder itself. And it's also partly down to the air pressure. Various tricks have been employed to make that as efficient as possible, but there are limits. You can only get so much air flowing into an engine. Even if you're using sonic waves and you've got a clever system, you can't exceed the 100% efficiency by a very big margin at all. So the power of an engine will vary depending on how high you are. No, not how high you are, how high the car is when you're driving it. So if you're at the top of a mountain, the air is thin. There's less oxygen going into the engine. So that's going to cause a lower amount of power. And if you're at sea level, the air is much thicker. There is more oxygen in that air. So the engine is going to make more power. Enter the turbocharger. It was first used in planes during the war and it enabled the plane to fly at a higher altitude because it was forcing more of this thin air into the engine itself. So this technology has naturally evolved and become part of our motor car. If you think about a three litre naturally aspirated engine, that has a limitation on how much of those three litres you can utilise with air going into the cylinders. If you've got a turbocharger, you're compressing the air and jamming the air into the cylinder. So you could be up 200 300% theoretically, the sky is the limit. A turbocharger greatly enhances the amount of air you can get into the engine. Why is that a good thing? Well, more air means more oxygen and more oxygen means you can burn more fuel. So the ratio of fuel to air is very carefully controlled in an engine. With diesel engines, there's a little bit more leeway. They're not quite as tightly regulated in terms of the air fuel ratio as the petrol ones. But by making the engine more efficient, getting more power out of smaller cylinders, you're getting better fuel economy. You're able to utilize the fuel more efficiently in these smaller capacity turbocharged engines. Turbos don't come without any problems or negatives. There's turbo lag. We've discussed that the turbo uses a turbine to spool up with the exhaust gases as they flow, and it then spins on the compressor side. The actual inertia of those turbocharged components mean that they don't spool up to maximum speed straight away. It may be there's insufficient exhaust gas flow to spin the turbine effectively and start producing power. So there's certainly an amount of lag due to the lower RPM that the engine is in just because the exhaust gases aren't flowing as quickly. But the inertia and the weight of those impellers or those turbines inside the turbocharger will also add to the delay. So sometimes you might be at the correct RPM. You might have lifted off the throttle, pushing back on the throttle, and it just takes it's a little while for the turbo speed to spool up. Manufacturers have got some systems in place to minimize those losses. We would describe that as anti-lag, things that keep the turbo spinning effectively and efficiently. 
a lot has been done to minimize turbo lag. We've also got dual scroll turbochargers, which utilize smaller channels that allow higher velocities from the exhaust gases and enables the turbo to make better power and improves the scavenging effect. That's the exhaust gases coming out of the cylinder cleanly. So there's a lot of benefits with these twin scroll turbochargers. And we've got all sorts of different technologies, variable vanes, which control the angle of the exhaust gases as they hit the vanes on the turbo and lots of other clever things going on inside the turbo unit itself just to maximize its efficiency and wring out every little scrap of power at any given point in the RPM range. You might think turbocharged engines are less reliable. There's less weight in them. They're smaller engines, so surely they break more easily. And let me know what you think about this in the comment section. Turbos are over-engineered. They use stronger components. You often see manufacturers moving from a naturally aspirated to a turbocharged variant of the engine, and they've thrown out all the old pistons and rods and they've replaced them with forged components. And this methodology applies to all the other aspects of the engine, from the fuel delivery system to the exhaust and the systems you've got in the exhaust, the EGR, the particulate filters and the catalyst. Everything really has been designed to run at higher velocities, higher temperatures and last longer. In the main, your turbocharged engine is just as reliable as a conventional engine, but some people would assert they require a little bit more care. They're more fussy over the types of oil you use and also the types of coolant you put in the engine. And it is certainly important to just look at the engine as a whole. If we were tuning it and increasing the power of the engine, we want to manage the heat effectively and just make sure we're not overworking the turbo. I've seen quite a few projects where people have just pushed the turbo too hard and it's led to a premature death on the turbo, although the owner was happy because that gave them an excuse to upgrade to a better unit. But turbo engines are relatively complex. And from the points made in this video, we can see why manufacturers are evolving cars to use turbochargers and they're moving to smaller capacity engines. And when you've got less going on in the engine bay, you can add hybrid components. So a hybrid is effectively an electric car and a conventional combustion engine car. And to get all of the components inside the engine bay would be impossible if you had a large capacity naturally aspirated engine, although some manufacturers have managed it. Thanks for watching. Please boot the like button. That really does help us to get out there, as does subscribing to the channel. And I've lined this video up for you and this playlist that you should find really interesting. Thanks for watching. See you in these next videos.